Welcome to the Working Without Waste podcast, powered by ERC Midwest, the podcast that's all about sharing ideas and stories that increase your productivity and decrease waste in your business and personal life. I'm your host, Mike Malatesta, one of the leaders here at ERC Midwest. Our guest today is Zach Marlin. Zach is our Transportation and Treatment Group Director here at ERC Midwest and the author of our newest ebook titled The Life Cycle of Wastewater. Today, we're going to talk about wastewater treatment. Specifically, Zach will walk you through how we manage our clients' wastewater, a process that his book covers in great detail. If you'd like to get a copy of the Life Cycle of Wastewater ebook, you can find it on our website at www.ercmidwest.com. So, Zach, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, this is very exciting for us because. Um, this is our this is our first creation of an ebook, and um, your first uh, published uh, author work as well. So um, so it's an exciting it's an exciting day for us, and I'm happy to share this with uh, with with everyone that's listening. So before we get started, Zach, why don't you um, give people a flair for you know who you are, where you came from, and how you've uh, how you how you came to write this book in the first place. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I guess I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I primarily lived here my whole life. I did have a brief stint, um, out East. I lived in Vermont for a while. Uh, when I was younger, about 20 years old, um, did a lot of skiing out there in the winter. Um, it was a great time in my life. And actually after I came back from Vermont, um, I ended up working for a very small wastewater treatment company. Um, they primarily focused in ultrafiltration, and that's how I got into the wastewater world. Um, it, from there, it just kind of uh, snowballed effect. Um, I, met a, I met a gentleman named Kevin Crosby, um, who started a company called Elite Environmental. Uh, at that point, it was just Kevin, and I started getting introduced into different types of treatment. So I was familiar with ultrafiltration at my, um, from my uh, previous original employment um, at this smaller company, but then I met Kevin and learned about chemical batch treatment and uh, metals precipitation, um, you know, acid breaking or oil oil emulsion breaking, and uh, yeah, that was like the the footprint of my career and the start of it, and it's just kind of taken a snowball effect, as I said, from there. Okay, super. So you you basically started in this industry as someone who probably had no awareness of it prior to starting would that be fair to say yeah that that that's that is correct so it kind of fascinated me so when i first got in the industry i just saw so much potential and it it was like a twofold thing so it was the industry and then also being a part of a smaller business really intrigued me too because every action that i took had a direct result that i could see so um, some of my previous jobs, I worked for fairly large corporations and, um, you know, at that point in my life, I didn't see that my actions had a direct effect, but, but starting out in the wastewater industry and then also starting out in a smaller business setting really kind of started driving that motivation and that, that um, developing the drive to, to really achieve as much as I could in, in this industry based on direct results that I saw from my actions. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting world we live in because what we do with wastewater, um, most flies under the radar of most people. So, um, even people that are in the industries that, that, that we service, um, most people understand that when they, Put the water on it goes down the drain in their house or they flush the toilet the water goes down the drain um, and they don't really have an awareness of where it goes and even though that's not what what we focus on ultimately our water that we treat and recycle goes to the same place as the water from homes and such but um the fact that that industry um and all types of activity generate 
or contaminate wastewater that needs then needs an intermediary step to come to a facility like ours, for example, to be to have pollutants removed um, from it is something that um, you know not many people know about, and um, we want to you know your book demystifies that and. And and I want you know we want people to know more about what happens to that because it's a very important part of the manufacturing process. It's a it's a it's an integral part of of um, the work that's needed uh, to to make all of the things that we enjoy and take for granted in life your clothes and your home and your car and everything, um, but also the impact that it has uh, on the environment. I mean we're 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 serving a very valuable uh, role in water sustainability cycle, um, which is why I think it was cool the way you, you titled the book, The Life Cycle of Wastewater, because li- wastewater does have an infinite li- life cycle, theoretically at least. It can, it's one of the few things that can be continually cleaned and reused over and over and over again. Um, there's not many, many things that, that can do that. So, um, so this industry, this sort of, Fly be fly below the radar industry. What? Let's start at the beginning. Someone, some process uh, contaminates wastewater, whether it's at a factory or, or, or wherever, and um, they can't uh, they can't discharge it into the sewer. What what does somebody what does somebody do, and how do we help them with that? And how does your book sort of take them through what what the steps are? Yeah. So I think. Um... You know, the first step would be to identify what type of wastewater you have and reaching out to um, a company like ours, ERC Midwest, is would help. We would be able to help guide you on that based on our analysis. But the first step would really be um, identifying what is creating the type of waste. And, and that starts with you know the waste profile or the waste characterization profile, which is going to kind of break down all the different qualities that that waste might have. So physical characteristics, um, you know, uh, the the process generating the waste, and then ultimately, um, you know, how that waste, um, what potential contaminants might be in that waste. And that's really the first start of everything is, is the profiling process. And that allows us to identify what types of treatment methods would be effective coupled with a sample of material. The sample is very important as well because that's gonna allow us to determine its treatability, the best disposal method, and then what ultimately the best treatment method too um, would be applied to that material. So when you get a sample of wastewater, Zach, what, um, what do we look at? What do you look at to make the assessment that you were just talking about? Yeah, so the first thing that we would look at is uh, physical characteristics and to ensure that, um, you know, for example, the pH of the material is within an acceptable range um, for for non-hazardous wastewater treatment. So that'd be between a 2 and a 12.5. We're looking for flashpoint. What is the flashpoint of the material? Once again, um, for non-hazardous wastewater treatment, we want to make sure that that flashpoint Um, is greater than 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Another very big important part of the makeup of the waste is also the heavy metal content of the water. So what type of heavy metals could be present? And then there's um, a whole slew of different types of other contaminants as well that we want to look at. So volatile organic compounds, semi-volatile volatile organic compounds. And and part of that too is actually just the process that's generating the waste because some some processes generate waste and they might have to go out for hazardous waste disposal. So all those things tie in together um, to really kind of encompass how to best manage um, a certain client's waste stream. Okay. And so when you, you, you can't just look at a wastewater and tell what's wrong with it, in other words. Yeah. That's true. Yep. So um, basically all, all those key components for analysis are done in a laboratory, our, our laboratories. And um, we have different types of instruments that are used for each individual uh, contaminant 
to be able to identify that. So for, for our flash tester, we use a closed cup flash test method, right? So essentially we'd add X amount of liquid into our flash cup or our flash tester and slowly ramp up the temperature from 60 degrees up in 10 degree intervals um, while applying flame in uh, a, a physical flame within those 10 degree intervals to see if there's actually uh, ignition of the material. That's how we would check for flash. If you're gonna check for right, heavy metals, we have a special instrument called an ICP uh, mass spectrometer, or excuse me, an ICP unit that, that, that is used for um, analyzing heavy metals um, through um, aqueous injection of a sample into this instrument that is then uh, atomized into basically a plasma. And then as that material is entered into the plasma, um, to break it down pretty simply, um, based on the wavelength that is given off when that material enters the plasma, we can tell what type of heavy metal is present in the wastewater. Okay. Um, another very common tool we use is just the pH meter. So um, just seeing how acidic or how alkaline a wastewater is, um, is also a very crucial part to understanding the overall composition of the waste. That also affects treatment because if we have a wastewater that's, um, you know, fairly acidic and potentially buffered where there's other components in the, in the waste that prevents adjustment of the pH, which is part of the treatment process, also uh, determines the treatability of the material. So there's, there's a lot of different factors that go into uh, the analysis of a wastewater stream. Okay. So we use a lot of sophisticated laboratory equipment to help us make the determination of what we're, what we're up against when, when we receive a sample. That's how, that's, that's how we decide whether we can, whether we can um, treat and recycle the wastewater. Yep, that is correct. Okay. All right, cool. So, um, so that the waste profile, the sample, um, everything's good with both of those. We, I assume that's, that that's like an, okay, everything, you know, okay, we can, we can manage this. There's some type of process that we go through to, to alert, um, our team and the client about that. And then we, um, I guess we send a truck to go pick up the wastewater and bring it back to one of our, one of our plants. And so when, when the truck arrives, um, what, what do we do then? Yeah. So, so when we're actually at the client site and we're physically removing the material from the holding vessel that the material's in, which could be a wider, wide array of different types of, uh, holding vessels, whether if it's a tank or a tote, but, um, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to identify where the material is. And then also we're going to do um, a real quick pH test on that material prior to picking it up um, based on the knowledge that it's a non-hazardous waste stream. Now, we also do um, transportation and, and management of hazardous waste streams, but, but that's not coming into the plants for, for our treatment process. We're specifically treating non-hazardous wastewaters. So one key thing is our drivers are always checking the pH because depending on the alkalinity or acidity of the wastewater, if it dips below a certain pH or above a certain pH, um, we would have to look at an alternative method at that point in time to handle the material, whether if it's pH adjusting on site or, or looking at management um, of the material as a hazardous waste. But okay. once we determine that the material is okay to pump via that pH strip, and knowledge of the profile and the sample, um, a vacuum truck would be used to physically pump the material out of the truck. And essentially it's just that, it's a large vacuum, right? So it's removing air from inside this, this big tanker truck, creating a vacuum, exhausting the air out while pulling the liquid in. So that material would then be um, loaded and secured in the truck. We lock all the caps on the trucks, ensure that our load is secured. Um, there's then a manifest that's completed um, that is associated with that specific waste stream. So it covers shipping purposes um, for the DOT and uh, RICRA, but then also that manifest holds uh, a very key piece of information on there, which is a profile number, which I guess I didn't elaborate on er earlier, but once we accept a waste stream, it is issued a profile number. That profile number is a unique fingerprint 
that's going to stay attached to that specific waste stream. And that, that profile number moves from all different types of documents. So we clearly communicate throughout the organization, whether if it's um, a truck driver going to pick up the material or a plant operator is offloading the tip, uh, material or a lab technician who is analyzing the material, everything about that specific waste stream um, really derives from that unique profile number that's assigned. So that is also on that shipping document that driver would have when we're on site removing the material. Okay. After um, the material is pumped, we would then have the manifest signed by the generator. We would all, the truck driver would also sign the manifest. Um, the load would be secured and then he'd be off on his way to the water treatment plant. Okay. And once, once, once we get there, so we've had the initial sort of evaluation of the waste by a sample um, and by analysis, then, then we have the, our driver plays a role in making sure that at least one, um, one uh, potential hazard, which is the pH, is, is okay before we pick it up. And then um, we drive it safely to, uh, to, to a, one of our plants. And um, what happens? Yeah, so it's very important what happens. So the material is then sampled again. So the first thing that happens is the truck would back into the plant. We would secure the truck by chalking the wheels. Um, we also have to sample the truck accurately. So we do that through a Kalawasa or a core sample of the material because different wastes can have layers that are built into it. So we always want to encapsulate the full spectrum of the material. So a plant technician would don a harness and attach himself to um, it's called a horizontal lifeline, but basically it's a system that prevents him from falling and hitting the ground if there's any sort of issue. So he would attach himself to all that safety material, climb on top of the tanker and grab this core sample of the waste. That waste is then, that sample is then brought into our lab. We're going to run a gambit of analysis. Once again, we're going to test for flash. We're going to test for pH. We're going to run for heavy, we're going to perform an analysis for heavy metals to ensure that that sample of that specific waste stream is matching the original profile that came, came in with the sample. So it's, it's a due diligence thing that we're ensuring that there's no um, variances because there's a lot of dynamics that are associated with wastewater, um, especially if there is multi-layers or, or potential solids or sludge in, in the material. So what we're doing is we're we're comparing that sample from the full uh, load of the material to the the profile that initially was completed, which is the I guess I like to refer to it as the birth certificate of the waste. It kind of describes everything about the waste. And so once that's done, we we unload the truck, I presume, and then um, and then the real kind of cool stuff starts, right? So we, we unload the truck and we, we have multiple treatment um, options or technologies that we use depending on which plant. Um, they're all set up a little bit differently from one another, but the core process is, is the same. And that's, we have to get out whatever is in the wastewater pollutant from a pollutant standpoint so that we can recycle it compliantly back to the, the city sewer. So, um, so what is that cool process? What, what, what happens once we unload the truck? Yeah. So, um, the process is, um, it, it's quite a large process, but, but there's a lot of stages and some are very simple, but the simplicity of it can also help, um, prevent further pollution. So identification of what categorical waste stream it is. And what I mean by that is, is there's, there's, three main categories of waste streams. There's, there's heavy metal waste streams or metals categorical, there's organic categorical, and there's also oils categorical. And part of this process just from offloading is separation of oil categorical and organic categorical waste streams. Because if you introduce an organic categorical waste stream through um, a system that contains oils, well, you're adding petroleum, which is uh, something we're trying to remove from the water and do remove from the water. But we, why why add something to a material that might not have it? So the first step would be uh -huh. uh, segregation of the waste stream based on its category. Um, the second part to that is 
um, bench samples and bench testing. So we would take um, samples of that waste stream and replicate treatment on a small scale to determine the best treatment method and um, chemical consumption and, and really break down what is the best method for, for removing these pollutants based on our lab analysis. So, so after the offload and decision of segregation of material, where, where does this waste go? Um, you know, it, it's essentially um, creating a little, little treatment scale in our lab and, and it's done to scale. So, you know, if, if we have X amount of volume of waste and we add X amount of chemical, we, we know how to scale that onto, um, you know, a size where it's replicating a 5,000 gallon tank of material. And it's going to start um, with generally agitation, depending on depending on the treatment method. We have three primary treatment methods, but but most of them involve agitation of the waste or mixing. And then um, once again, if it if it's if like it's an oily waste stream, we have to remove that oil initially prior to further treatment. So in that case, we would break those those oils out of solution, causing them to float. Uh, to the top of the wastewater tank by adding chemicals such as sulfuric acid and some other starch-based chemi chemistry, um, performing that action while mixing, killing the mixers after the chemical has been added, and then actually gauging the sample pulled from the tank to see how well that treat actually performed. Okay, so in your book, I think you refer to that as uh, the recipe. or or I've heard you refer to it as the recipe. And when I hear you say it, it kind of reminds me of like a, like a chef, for example, is putting um, all kinds of ingredients together to make a particular recipe. And that's what we get is the byproduct of that recipe. And so our job is to really re-engineer uh, the recipe. We actually use our own recipe to take apart the recipe that was put Put, put that was employed in the first place to make the waste. Is that, am I on the right track there? Oh yeah. You hit it right on the head and that's exactly what it mm -hmm. is. It is a recipe. And, and part of uh, the, the real part that's real invigorating to me about it is, is that recipe kind of changes all the time. So like every day um, there's a new challenge that's associated with, with material. And for the most part, it's, there is similarities, but if you can just, you know, maybe add a little bit more chemical or or adjust it so you, you're creating a little bit less treatment flock or the sludge, the byproduct of treatment, you know, we're always looking for better ways to to minimize our waste. But but yeah, there there are that's pretty much it. A recipe to kind of disassemble the recipe that created the waste initially. Okay. And you met you mentioned the solids, and the solids are Everything that we remove essentially comes out as a solid. So, we, right, the, the 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 water, the solids are bound to the water when it comes in to, to us by this recipe or whatever. And then our recipe re-engineer or disengineers maybe is a better word. I don't know. Um, and whatever's in there from a pollutant standpoint generally comes out as a as a sludge, what we would call a sludge or or a flock. And um, as I understand it, the the you know, you can do that, you can do the recipe a bunch of different ways, but ultimately you want to achieve the result with the least amount of solids. So you want to get everything out with the least amount of solids because that makes it easier for us to recycle more of the water. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. We're always looking at ways to, to minimize our waste byproduct. And um, the sludge content or the flock content is is something that, that is part of that process. So uh, we want to recycle as much of that water as possible. And, and, that's, and that's done by consistently analyzing and, and changing um, certain recipes. If, if we have a large amount of sludge that's generated, we're going to try a lot of different alternatives um, for the recipes to see what we can do to minimize that. Okay. So once we've done the... Um... We've employed our recipe. We've we've removed the pollutants. We, um, what do we do with the waste then? So it's been brought in. We we treat it. It's um, 
remove the pollutants. Now, now what? I mean, this this is the cool part. This is the sustainability part, as I as I understand it. Yeah. So after um, the treatment's been performed, um, I'll revert back to analysis. There's always a lot of analysis involved in the wastewater world. So after we created that that recipe and implemented it um, on a large scale, and that treat has been um, been performed, we're going to take a sample of that treated wastewater and we're going to analyze it again to ensure that we're meeting compliance um, from the sewage, sewage district. So we always want to be looking at, hey, did we do an effective job of, of removing this contaminant? If we didn't, well, then we have to re-engineer that, that wastewater treat and revisit it. But what we're always looking for is maximum removal of heavy metals. And that, that starts with the analysis again. So after the treatment is per, treat is performed, we're going to analyze that, that wastewater again to ensure it meets compliance with, with the sewage district. Okay. And I, 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 I forgot to ask you about that before, but you, you mentioned it there. So our facilities, our wastewater facilities, have their own permits that um, require us to, uh, to meet standards established by the, um, the, the, the sewer district um, for us to discharge the water back, back into it. Yep, that is correct. Yep, so the standards are set uh, for us. Those standards, um, th that's the law of the land. So that's, that's, that's what we have to do. That is the goal. And then just as an extra um, you know, set of security measure, we have certain parameters where you know, if, if our discharge limitation, for example, is 100 parts per million on fats, oils, and grease, well, we're going to put a buffer zone in there always to ensure that, that there's no compliance issues down the line. Mm. So for example, we would never discharge anything below 80 ppm petroleum-based um, okay. contaminant in a waste. Yeah, so we build in a but, question, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, and when we when we discharge the water, so we treat, we, we, we did a four steps of analysis. If, 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 if I, and it's maybe more if something doesn't go right with our recipe, um, we verify that we meet the permit. Then the wastewater, we, we, we discharge, we essentially gravity uh, unload it again into the sewer system, but it passes through a couple of things on its way there. Yeah, correct. So um, it passes through initially as we're discharging, we have kind of an extra security feature too called an oil coalescing pit. So um, the wastewater is then, um, after it's been cleared from the lab, obviously, goes through a series of plumbing and empties into this, this pit that has um, these two coalescing packs that are going to separate any potential droplets of petroleum that, that could still reside or potentially could have been, um, you know, stuck to the side of of a tank or something. So that's just an extra security feature okay. for us to ensure compliance. Also, there, there's inline pH meters that we have um, just to ensure that the pHs are always at the proper parameters. And then past that, there's um, two specific pieces of equipment that are used all the time. There's one called an auto sampler. And then there's also another piece of equipment called a flow meter. So the auto sampler is a way for us to um, gather 24 hour composite or gather composite samples of material that's been discharged through a certain time frame and that's also tied together with with our flow meters as well which is keeping track of how much flow or how many gallons had got have been discharged through a specific uh, wastewater flume or outfall because every wastewater type of categorical wastewater has a different specific outfall that has to be monitored separately. Okay. And so at that point, getting back to kind of where we started at the beginning with people's awareness of where wastewater goes, at that point, the treated wastewater goes through the coalescing, goes through the sampler, the flow meters, and then it's basically just, it basically drops into the sewer system, just like anything else that you would, would, have from your house go into the sewer system or your workplace or wherever, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yep. It would all the materials discharge into the sanitary sewer system. And then through a network, so network of pipes and lift station, lift stations eventually it ends up at uh, the municipal treatment plant. And um, we'll go through then um, 
a digest a, a biological treatment process at that point. Huh. So that's cool. So so even if you don't really have an understanding of what we do, which most people don't, the end is really the same. It's just turn on the faucet, water comes out, you use it, it goes down into the sink, down to the municipal water treatment facility, and then back into the environment, into a lake or a stream or whatever, and so that it can be used again for all kinds of purposes, recreational, water, which we all need, and processes too, to make things. Yeah, it really is a life cycle of water and of wastewater because it is continuous. It, it's, 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 being pulled from an area and then used in a process, those contaminants are then added through that process. Then we receive it, remove those contaminants, and then back down to the sewer system it goes, a little bit of additional treatment through bi biological, um, and then, yeah, back into a body of water. And it, it truly is like an encompassing circular cycle. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it, it really is a beautiful thing. It, it's cool. It's it's an, it's an awesome industry to be in and to see that happen on a daily basis. Um, you know, it, it energizes, energizes me every day. Well, Zach, thank you so much for being on the show. How can people reach out to you if they want to connect with, with you, Zach, which, what should they do? Yeah. So if they want to connect with me, um, you can reach out at me on my LinkedIn, LinkedIn, or also through, um, ERC Midwest website. Um, we have multiple different um, avenues that that you can reach myself or or any one of our experts in the industry. Um, so that that's or my phone number, <laughs> which I think would probably be on there as well too. But uh, yeah, our website or my LinkedIn account would be great avenues for reaching out, and I'm here uh, to answer any questions. All right, and as I said at the beginning, if you want uh, a copy of of Zach's ebook, uh, The Life Cycle of Wastewater. You can find that on our website at www.ercmidwest.com. Zach, thanks for, thanks for writing the book. Thanks for coming on our show and sharing your enthusiasm and your expertise on a subject that's really, really cool and, and instrumental in the way that our world works, but that so many people just don't, don't know about. Now they do. Thanks for having me, and um, I look forward to uh, hearing back from someone. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Working Without Waste podcast. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to the podcast on our website at www.ercmidwest.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also be grateful if you'd rate the podcast and leave a review. That helps other people find us and gets the show's value into more people's ears.